exchange that um, I'll try to facilitate. Um, uh, excellent. And we appear to, some attendees appear to be coming in um, in addition to the panelists. Kelly, do we start out with a, um, a bit of a overview of what this committee is about? Yes. Um, yeah. Let me just give a little context for, sorry, <laughs> that light is very blinding. Uh, a little context um, for folks that are, are new to the academies um, and our processes. Um, so first of all, thanks for joining us to, <laughs> today. Um, so today is the first meeting of the Committee of the Decadal Survey of Ocean Sciences for NSF, um, and NSF is our sponsor. Um, so when we start a new study, we like to start with a sponsor briefing to hear more about the context and importance of that study, and also hear the sponsor's perspective on what is and isn't included um, in the statement of task. And at the end of that discussion, the committee, staff, and sponsor um, should all be on the same page on the committee's charge. Um, so as, as Tuba mentioned, Jim McManus is here today to provide the briefing. And, um, and then uh, before he starts, I'll provide a few, uh, a few slides um, and information about our process um, so that every, everybody on this call is on the same page. Um, so first, for those not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are a private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, so the slide lists our, our committee. We've assembled a committee of 21 volunteers who were chosen for their expertise and experience, and they serve pro bono to carry out this uh, study statement of task. Um, you'll notice at the top, it says provisional. Um, that is provisional until we have our discussion later today. So um, some people on the line may have seen that we had a 20 day public comment period after posting the committee membership. Um, this afternoon, we will uh, consider the comments presented, and we will discuss as a committee, um, is there any expertise that we're missing, anything we need to fill? If we are missing something, we'll say, or do we need another committee member? Do we need two committee members? Can we get that expertise um, by bringing in speakers uh, and that kind of thing? So we'll, we'll discuss all of the input that we've received. We appreciate all the comments um, and um, after those decisions were made, we'll fill any any fill in any um, spots that we need to fill, and then after that point, um, the committee would be finalized. So right now we are provisional, um, and we'll have that discussion later today. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the, uh, Jim will talk more about this, so I won't say much. But the the committee's task is divided into two parts. Um, first, focus on scientific ocean drilling. Um, and look at you know what are the big research priorities um, that remain that require scientific ocean drilling to answer, and then um, and at the same time we'll be looking at the full report. Um, next slide, um, where we have five other bullets um, for the statement of task, really de designing a portfolio of scientific questions um, for NSF and identifying the infrastructure needed and uh, the um, different types of collaborations and. Um, and the kind of the workforce needed to actually carry out that work. Um, so Jim will be talking a lot more about that. So I'm going to fly through those. Um, and then uh, timeline, some of the questions that we get early on is, you know, when can we expect the report? Oh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, we are in, the, in a, the beginning of a two year study. So over the course of two years, the committee will hold a total of five two day hybrid meetings, such as this one, um, for the purposes of public information gathering, deliberation, report writing, and response to peer review. Um, the committee will also meet virtually each month to keep things moving. Um, and then the result of the work will be two peer reviewed reports um, that represent the consensus view of the committee. So the interim report will be the first of those, which is focused on scientific ocean drilling priorities, and that will be released towards the end of this year. And then the final report, which will incorporate the, the findings and conclusions from the interim, um, will then be released in early 2025. Um, next slide, please. Um, and lastly, um, you can find the committee statement of task, um, the committee bios and information on past and upcoming meetings on the project webpage. This is all public information, and I will post the link to that webpage in the chat in just a second. 
Um, so welcome, Jim. <laughs> um, so Jim is serving as the director of the Division of Ocean Sciences at NSF. Um, he's our, our committee's um, sponsored contact, and we're really excited to discuss the statement of task with him today. So the floor is yours now, Jim. Thank you, Kelly. Um, good morning, and thank you for having me here to talk with you about the next decadal survey for NSF's Division of Ocean Sciences. As Kelly said, my name's Jim McManus, and I'm the division director for the Division of Ocean Sciences. Before going on, I want to say uh, in advance, thank you to this committee. Um, I, you've all signed up for a large task. I, I hope that was communicated. <laughs> um, and but it, but to the basic research enterprise, it's an incredibly important task uh, and one that your message back to us from the community is one we will take quite seriously so the value of the conversations that you will have over the next year and a half um, will will help us communicate at, as a division going forward within the national science foundation and back outward to our community next slide So why did we ask for this study? Uh, to answer that question, I first want to point you to our miss mission, and ours meaning the National Science Foundation. Uh, NSF promotes the progress of science by investing in research to expand knowledge in science, engineering, and education. NSF also invests in actions that increase the capacity of the U.S. to conduct and exploit such research. Part of how we go about our decision-making process is through community input. Um, we don't operate in a vacuum. One way we accomplish that is through our peer review process, a process that many of you have heard me before have heard I'm most proud of here in the United States. But we also need regular input through a variety of uh, other mechanisms. Next slide, please. These other mechanisms, include through Congress and the Executive Office of the President, interactions with other agency partners, community input, such as that which will occur during the process of developing this decadal survey and other workshops, professional society reports, and the various advisory committees that work with us within the National Science Foundation. These combined inputs have provided a number of focus areas within the broader geosciences, which you can see on the right of the slide there, um, but include topics like climate, inter which include topics like climate intervention, geologic or climate hazards, new technologies, and the need for new research infrastructure. Next slide, please. In more detail, or perhaps, to be pedantic, um, the new decadal survey will provide recommendations for OCE considering changing the changing scientific landscape, national priorities, and emerging opportunities. Next slide, please. What we want from a new decadal survey is for our science to remain nimble and consider issues of timeliness, urgency, societal benefit, and technological advances that create new opportunities to address our most pr pressing issues. This is a big ask, but it is how we will focus on the critical role of the ocean in the broader Earth system. Next slide, please. Under the broad umbrella of what we are looking for, we need to continuously query the question, uh, what research infrastructure is needed to advance the high priority ocean science research questions over the coming decades? And I really want to emphasize the plural of decades. We invest in research that, although this decadal survey is by name a decadal survey, uh, 10 years, we really think in terms of our investments as being more like. Uh, 25 to 50 years in terms of our infrastructure. Um, many of you know our 
our, the ships that we support extend well beyond 10 years, although we have three new ones coming online in the uh, coming year or so. As I wrote on this slide, without the right tools, we will not be able to advance our science to its fullest potential, and we will run the risk of not meeting society's greatest needs. Next slide, please. I wanna make the point that we need to identify opportunities and strategy in this report to promote innovative multi disciplinary and multi-sectorial approaches to address complex science challenges arising from the intersection of natural processes, societal needs, and human-driven environmental change. What this somewhat long-winded sentence, okay, it is not somewhat, it was long-winded, is getting at is that many of the world's problems really go well beyond what single disciplinary approaches can deliver. As you think about how to approach this charge, I ask you to consider the extensive work laid out under the Ocean Climate Action Plan as an example, which is a whole of government approach to addressing the ocean's role in climate mitigation and adaptation strategies and many other community or government efforts that focus on society's grand challenges and how we, as the NSF supported basic research enterprise, can best rise to help with those challenges. We also want to hear about in how innovation we also want to hear about innovation and how we can train the next generation of ocean scientists expand our research in ocean literacy and become a scientific community that honors the principles of diversity equity inclusion environmental justice and accessibility into our scientific endeavors next slide please Within the construct of this report, there are multiple important questions for you all to keep in the back of, our, of your minds as we move forward. How do we balance our infrastructure with the science we do within a constrained budgetary environment? Um, what I, another way of saying this is, please be pragmatic. <laughs> What should be our key science priorities for the future and why? How do we meet the needs of advancing marine technology? Who are the key partners we should engage with and why? How can our science be more impactful to the broader community at home and abroad? By the way, the end why matters to us. What will make the report most effective is for it to be a vis visionary in the work we do. What the report needs to not be is a list of detailed, well-articulated scientific questions. Our, poor our core programs will continue to support innovative and visionary science. But we also need to hear from the broad community about priorities. At some point, a list of priorities is no longer a list of priorities by virtue of the fact of its length. I don't have a straightforward answer for you to what that length is, but bear in mind it's short. <laughs> to the science community, I ask that you come to the various community gatherings with visionary intent. And I ask you, where does basic oceanographic research need to lead over the next 10 to 25 years? To the community, to the committee, I ask that you see yourself as listeners. To the community and not as advocates for a portion thereof. Next slide, please. Would you advance one more? Thank you. One of the things I just wanna spend a couple of minutes on is our ask for an interim report on scientific ocean drilling. NSF supported scientific ocean drilling has, long, has a long near 50 year history within the oceanographic community. Over the past 20 years in particular, NSF along with international partners have been supporting scientific ocean drilling through two 10 year agreements with the most recent agreement coming to a close at the end of the federal fiscal year of 2024. These activities have resulted in a broad network 
of authors of program related journal articles. The figure to the right is from 2023 to 2021. Over the life of scientific ocean drilling, this research has made foundational discoveries that have changed the way we think about a variety of earth, ocean, and climate related issues. Next slide, please. One more, please. Okay, one more. <laughs> Thank you. The Geordie's resolution is and has been the most utilized of the three international ocean International Ocean Discovery Program assets, which includes the Japanese drilling vessel, the Chikyu, and a portfolio of mission-specific platforms supported in partnership with the European Consortium of Ocean Research Drilling. U.S.-supported activities have included roughly five expeditions on the JR per year, scientific participation on partner platforms, as seen on the slide, and sample curation and community leadership. Non-binding partnerships between the NSF and international partners have been documented through a variety of memoranda and offered the structure of these agreements pretty much for the last two decades. Next slide. Could you advance? Nope, back, thanks. <laughs> With the close of the current agreement at the end of fiscal year 2024, we are faced with some new challenges in the scientific drilling enterprise. Number one, the Joides resolution has been the most utilized of these three assets. However, as the current IODP agreement comes to an end, international support, which we've relied on to keep uh, JR operations going, has declined with little commitment post fiscal year 2024 for future international funding support. Furthermore, at 45 years old, the Joides resolution is approaching the end of its useful life. The US needs to build a vision, and this is your, your task as both a community and a, and a committee, is to build a vision for the future of scientific ocean drilling supported within the United States. Next slide, please. With these financial and logistical challenges, OCE has decided not to renew the current cooperative agreement, which supports the current operations of the JR and ends at the end of fiscal year 2024. OCE is discussing how to support an effective and financially sustainable US-led scientific ocean drilling program while balancing long-term OCE community programmatic priorities over the next 10 to 25 years. NSF is committed to maintaining access to US-owned cores and the associated data archives for its community. The interim report will include discussion of scientific ocean drilling priorities that will guide the growth of the next generation of the scientific ocean drilling enterprise supported within the US. Under this growth, Scientific ocean drilling objectives will need to be matched to available technologies. We also need to reimagine the methods of scientific ocean drilling and develop a portfolio of possible sub seabed sampling approaches that are targeted at our most urgent scientific priorities. This portfolio of approaches will inform how we invest in future infrastructure. Attendant to these needs, I want to point to two upcoming events. The first is an imminent announcement of an, actually it, it, it came out this morning, of an upcoming town hall, which will be hosted by the US Science Support Program. And that's on July 6th, I believe at two o'clock in the afternoon, Eastern time. The second is the first workshop hosted by this de decadal survey committee, which will be meeting August 2nd and 3rd. So with that, I want to, sort of close the, the loop for now on the, on the activities for August 2nd and 3rd associated with ocean drilling and bring us back to the, the larger umbrella of why we're here today. Next slide, um, which is I want, I want to bring us back to the variety of urgent needs that are in front of us, uh, not only as a committee and, and as a nation, but as, as, a, as the world. 
These are issues that have been dis discussed throughout GEO over the past year, and they're continuously discussed issues, not only at NSF, but throughout the halls of our institutions. Uh, and, and in the particular case of the, the sort of cloud of words, these are directorate-wide priorities that are taking form to varying degrees, uh, and to varying degrees, OCE will be part of these. I want to call out in particular climate intervention, hazards and extreme events, critical minerals and new technologies. My ask to you is, are there particularly impactful elements within these topics where OCE can most make a scientific impact? And if so, what are the key challenges we will need to overcome? And with that, next slide, I will stop and take any questions that folks may have. Thank you for your time and attention. All right. Thank you, Jim. Um, so we're going to be raising our virtual hands. <laughs> um, so please raise your hands um, and we'll call in the order of hands raised. Um, if we have time left, um, we can also take a question or two from, from the participants. You may submit your questions or comments using the Q&A function. Right. In fact, we, it, we encourage that even if we don't have time to answer them, it's good to know what the questions are that the general public brings. I see that there are 42 attendees, so that's mm -hmm. great. Thank you for making the time, you all, to be part of this discussion. Yes. Thank you. Um, so the first question is from Allison. Thanks for that, Jim. Could you give a more detailed update on the status of the research vessels that you mentioned will be finished soon? Sort of. <laughs> so the, and I'm looking to Tuba because last week, both Tuba and I were, were visiting the shipyard where they're, they're being built. So um, the Tani, which is the first ship, um, is currently in the water. So from the exterior, it, it looks very much like a brand new ship. From the inside, it looks like a ship that's not fi finished being built. Um, that's not really your question, Allison, but uh, the short story is that we have been given um, some reasonable insurance and assurances that we could uh, still meet a spring 2024 delivery. Um, there's probably uh, some amount of realistic expectation that it, that it could slide a little later than that. Um, and what I will say is there's reasonable optimism. These two events are disconnected, but there's reasonable optimism that the subsequent two vessels will follow in four month increments after the Tani being the first one is delivered. Um, so that, that, you know, sort of puts us somewhere in, in early 2025 um, for having the three vessels Tuba, did I capture all that about right? <laughs> all right. Thank you. Uh, Jim was next. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Jim Yoder. Yeah, it's on. Um, yeah, I just two quick clarification questions. So one is, um, uh, should this should this committee be considering research in the in the polar regions, or is that sort of polar programs issue, not not ours? And and then yeah, that that that's one question. Then I had a, one other uh, clarification question. I think the the short answer is that's largely under polar programs purview. The more nuanced and and uh, sort of vague answer is um, it is envisioning thinking about how uh, OCE might interact with polar programs we do um, as I as I think you know so so not to draw the very clear boundary if you will between what OCE does and OPP does because we do have um, interactions across those divisions and then one other one other clarification one has to do with ocean drilling it um, the second point, um, 
uh, asked that uh, what questions of the unanswered questions, what could be addressed through the use of existing scientific drilling assets, including uh, the archives and existing platforms. By existing platforms, would that include uh, piston cores and long cores, non-drilling uh, ways to collect cores? Uh, yes, Jim, to, to that partially. Um, there's, but the more complete answer is there are other ways. Uh, there's a uh, seafloor, there's a seabed drill, seabed drill rigs. Um, there's, uh, there's commercially contracted uh, drilling vessels and, and the mission specific platforms that ECORD supports are a, a swath, if you will, of, of industry uh, vessels or platforms that, that have supported drilling in, in the, over the past 10 to 20 years. All right, thank you. Brad, uh, Moran. Morning, Jim. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I wondered, if it came up before you're in the room here. Uh, the last Decadal survey, as you know, was driven to a significant extent, the balanced research versus core science. Um, I don't know where that number is right now. I asked that before, and um, maybe you could comment on that. But my sense is the needles tick back to the infrastructure, uh, taking more of the pie, if you like. So that's a specific question, but also I like to see that this workforce word is in here and for this group and broadly the workforce for ship operations. <laughs> Maybe you want to comment on that and cybersecurity because we have ships tied up at docks right now that should be sailing. And so this is a key, in my opinion, challenge that is not that obvious to the community, perhaps certainly ones that are not using ships. Thanks. So I'll address the workforce one first. So I very much want workforce uh, at the forefront of your minds. Uh, we, we inside OCE think about it all the time. There is a, a relatively new program that, that NSF supports that, that supports this particular sector of the, of the workforce. Um, the reality is, and you know this, Brad, probably even better, or certainly as well as I do, that, that we're also in, in a high competition market. And so how, how do we, we are listening to ideas for how we approach that, that challenge. It's, it's a real challenge. Um, and you forgive me, but I forgot your first question already. The balance between oh. research and infrastructure, uh, your infrastructure call. Yeah. If you, so we're a little bit uh, weighted towards facilities, but not far from 50-50. Um, I would say that, that there were a number of decisions made uh, over, before my time uh, in OCE that, that brought those, the facilities and science closer to in line. Um, it, it also depends on how you count it because our traditional facilities are, are, are ships, drilling, and um, OOI. But there are other facility infrastructure pieces that we that we fund that are that are smaller than that that don't necessarily get counted with the large facilities. So you could quibble about the 50-50, but it's it's really not that far off. I would say that we've gotten that message. Um, I think unless you're going to this committee and, and our scientific community want to drastically change that message. I don't see that as being an emphasis of this decadal survey. It was very much was an emphasis, as you said, Brad, it was very much an emphasis of the prior decadal survey. I don't expect that this time around, um, simply because I don't expect something completely dramatically different. Um, yeah. Thank you. Kristen. Hi, thank you for the report um, that you gave us to get us off the ground. Um, I've got um, a couple of questions related to the interim report and um, I guess some of the language in it. So um, one question is about defining the high priority research questions. And 
the 2050 science framework that was developed by the community was, was I believe very intentional in not laying it out as questions, but as scientific objectives and, and uh, longer term um, initiatives. Um, so are you envisioning that, that um, you know, that would be one of the reports we'd be drawing from. So we would be kind of recrafting the messaging in a question format. Um, so that's one, one question for you. And then a related one is, what is the relationship between the questions for them, the interim report and the goal for concise overarching ocean science questions in the final report? So, two, thank you. So, two que two two comments. So, at the risk of forgetting the first question, um, the 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 overarching um, question uh, it is what to do about questions. This sounds yeah. starting to sound silly, right? Um, and I have to admit that as I was going through, so this is full disclosure, as I was going through the tasks, uh, it occurred to me that that word was probably the single most problematic word because it's the vaguest word um, in, in essentially in the charge. Um, and so there does not have to be question marks at the end of, of priority areas from, from our perspective. In fact, if you think about it as probably one of the, I hate to put it this way, but what we need right now, and I've said is not once, but we really don't want a laundry list of, of questions. And so then you're stuck with um, what do you want? We, we really want priority areas for inquiry where OCE can have its, the largest impact. And when I say the largest impact, that's impact on the scientific enterprise and impact for the people in the US. And so you, you have a recording, I said it, don't get hung up on the questions term, please. That, that helps. That, that would, like I said, I realize that's somewhat misleading. And that actually bleeds into your first question very much, which is thinking about, and the challenge inside of uh, ocean drilling space is that we need to think time scale. It's not exactly true that it could take a couple decades to build a new scientific drilling research vessel. but I'll be very realistic <laughs> that that's the kind of time scale you're talking about, the three ships that I talked about. So I was, a, I was a rotator at NSF 15 years ago. We were talking about those ships then. And that wasn't the, and I'm looking over at Jim, that wasn't the first, <laughs> that wasn't the first conversation. So that there are ways to speed up that clock, but, but to think that we could speed up that clock in five years is we're not operating in, in, in real. So it's the challenge of thinking about the health of the ocean drilling enterprise for the next 20 years. That's really what, what we need to do. And how do we wed those, those priorities with the practical reality of the, of the, technologies we have at hand and what can we do to help? Long-winded answer, sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Ajit. Jim, this is a slightly more, uh, I guess, uh, how do you do it question. Curious to know if we can uh, expand a little bit more on what I personally see as inherent contradiction between being nimble and planning for 25 to 50 years that you mentioned. So just curious to know, what it is that you're looking for there? A really good question, Ajit. So nimble um, means we don't, to me, it means we don't over-constrain what we do 
to the point where we're locked into, essentially OCE is locked into a set of priorities that, that, that we don't have the, bit, the ability to respond to new ones. And practical reality is it is, is our job, meaning at mine and my colleagues at NSF to make sure we don't do that. So Ajit, another way of saying that is we still want or we still intend, very much intend to have a very nimble core program uh, enterprise. That that is who we are. We are a we are the federal government's basic research enterprise in the ocean realm, and we take a great deal of pride in that. So, the word nimble was placed there to remind me, to remind us all that we still belong in that space. Um, this isn't, we're not, we're not looking to turn ourselves into a mission agency. That, that's not who we are or who we want to be. It's a little bit of walking a, walking a line, but, but I, think you, I, I think that made sense. Thank you. Uh, Brad DeYoung. Hey, Jim, thanks for, thanks for being here. So I, I wanted to kind of get your reaction or perspective on, on one aspect of this overall study, because if we think of the science that we're talking about, environmental science, we can focus on the specifics of how to do the science and which are the best questions to ask. But there's also the approach and the, the strategy to kind of developing the study of it. And you know, if you touch any part of the planet now, it ripples across the whole planet. And that's true both environmentally and also societally. The things we do touch much more widely than we had thought of or, and did in the past. And so in thinking about that, the question then is how we as a group might best provide advice or input around how, how to build those new strategies or approaches. I mean, in a in a disciplinary sense, you can talk about, you know, transdisciplinary and, you know, collaborative and multidisciplinary and all those things. And I think that's in a space which we're all comfortable with. But in a partnership space, it's also much more complicated because there are many more players in place now than was true decades ago. Private sector partners, NGOs, you know, foundations that put large amounts of money in particular areas. Internationally, we have the Ocean Decade for sustainable development, and there's just endless kind of coordination and collaboration there. So the question that I was looking for you to comment on, that's the background, was, you know, how do you see us best providing guidance or, you know, to NSF? And then just broadly, how does NSF see itself in this kind of, unfortunately, in a sense, it's a good and a bad story, new story, complicated, but potentially much more productive landscape. So the questions aren't getting easier. Um, <laughs> so um, there's two there's two pieces of the answer. So how do we build I'm trying to think of whether I should start with I have this sort of default where I keep Referring to the second question first, um, so so I'll do that here as well. Um, your question, I'm going to rephrase what I what I think I heard, which is, um, how do we be most effective in in interagency and, if you will, uh, outside of the agency space as a as a fundamental research enterprise. Um, and I think, and then your first question is, how do we build that strategy? And it, I think part of the answer to both is remind ourselves who we are. So, and if you will, I, if you'll bear an example, <laughs> and I, I don't like using examples in this particular context because it, it creates rabbit holes, <laughs> um, but, but it, think about marine carbon dioxide removal. There is clearly space where we as an agency um, can bring to bear quite a bit of um, basic research 
know-how and query that will address the consequences, if you will, of marine carbon dioxide research or the mechanisms for how one might best do that. There are folks uh, in the philanthropic world, in other agencies that are approaching marine carbon dioxide research in quite frankly, in very different ways. And I, I think that's the, what you're referring to as the good news, bad news is that that's what's happening. Um, and so, and I'm using marine carbon dioxide research on purpose because it's something that is very topical. We've been, we inside the foundation have been thinking about it. You, you all as a community have been thinking about it. So it's, now to your question about, so before I leave interagency space, so we work a lot. Somebody asked me, I've been asked multiple times, what do you do all day? Um, one of the things that I do all day is communicate. And I communicate outside of the agency quite a bit. And it's hard space to work um, because you're bringing together agencies that have very different identities and how they approach science. Um, but what I would say is I am, I am buoyed by the desire for others to work inside interagency space to make progress. So that's sort of big umbrella language. Um, we do it, we want to continue to do it, and we want to look for avenues to expand that, perhaps even into philanthropic space in, in ways. Um, how do you build a strategy that is attendant to our strengths? That's your first question, or, or that's my version of your first question. Um, and that's constantly reminding ourselves to think about what we're good at. Um, Marine CDR, ha there, it's sort of one of these things that, that's, that's a big, it's a big can of unknowns. So let's think about a strategy for how we, as the basic research, as NSF's basic research community, can engage in that space and what it is we can bring to the table for our community of researchers that would allow sort of effective leveraging of other opportunities and making headway in space where we're the right folks to do that work. And so, Again, that's pretty high level, but, uh, but I'm trying to say that we need, to, we need your wisdom. How's that? Um, we need your wisdom to help us think about how we best build a strategy and let us, I mean, let us worry about how we interact with interagencies and, and other partners. I mean, that's, we need to do that. Um, but I'm gonna stop there. Was that helpful? <laughs> No, it's good. It's good to hear. I spent about a decade trying to coordinate uh, basin scale funding between NSF, NSERC in Canada, and the European Commission, and it was banging heads against walls for for a lot of that time. I I suspect, though, and that's partly why I asked that question, that there's a perspective that we need to look for new ways to doing these things, and we can't just say, well, we don't have a mechanism to to share funding, or we can't do this or that, which was kind of the reactions we got to this 20 years ago. I don't think that's the first reaction you get anymore. It's much more likely you'll get, well, this is gonna be a little bit of a headache, but once we get through it, we'll be in a better place. I probably wasn't supposed to say it that way, but it's true. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Tuba. So I have two questions related to the differences between the statement of task last time and this time, and I'll ask them one at a time. <laughs> um, so one of them is, uh, you know, last statement of task for the, the uh, Decadal Survey Committee really started with high level scientific questions. And that's certainly a question you're asking us too. you know, tell us the high priority scientific issues that need to be addressed. But when I read our statement of task, I'm also seeing that you're asking us some wisdom and strategies around things like how do we stay nimble or a strategy to promote innovative multidisciplinary multi-sectoral approaches. 
Um, so tell me a little bit more about where that's coming from. Um, what is it that you all are soul searching around that's making you ask us that question? And then I'll ask my second one after that. So th thanks to me. Th this is a little bit going back to what Brad was just asking. So the soul searching is um, the language that's used in the statement of tasks is what I, it's really hard to ask these big, to answer the big questions with hard specifics. But what I, but when I wrote those and rewrote them, it, it's, I'm trying to bring the thought process up, up, a, up a level thinking that there's a lot of things that we already do inside the program that are, we know how to do that. And, and we know how to do a lot of the other things. Um, but part of nimble, even though part of nimble is being small, but part of nimble is also being able to communicate a, as, as Brad was asking, um, communicate across agencies. And what I would say is we're better at that than we used to be. And, and, I don't mean we as an NSF. I mean we as the as the federal family. We're we're simply better at those conversations, um, and, and honestly, there there's more sense of purpose for why we we want to do certain things. You know, marine carbon dioxide research is is a great example of of something that that showed up on the streets back in the fall. The Solicitation went out. A bunch of proposals came in. I, I may be misspeaking, but there were something like seven federal agencies involved with with funding parts of that. That's something we can do. That that's actually relatively considering um, working in interagency space. That that was pretty straightforward. Partly because the ocean community has a mechanism. The NOP is national. Ocean Partnership Program is is facilitates exactly what we're talking about. Um, we're, federal space is not easy space to sort of work together, but this presents an opportunity, and it it's been used. I want to say twenty five years, um, so it's been around a long time, and to varying degrees, NSF has been a, a partner inside that um, mechanism. So. I don't know that I've actually really gotten to your first question. So it might be better if we ask me multiple questions at once and I sort of drift between the answers. <laughs> okay, my second question is related. So you, you're, you're allowed to drift. Um, you mentioned earlier that the first report, uh, one overarching thing that was in the mind of NSF at that time was, you know, what's the right investment strategy between infrastructure and research? Right now, what is the equivalent of that question in you all's mind? What's keeping you up at night? Um, one of the things that that one of the things that keeps us up at night is honestly the climate problem and how we as um, as an agency can best facilitate our communities to be impactful in that space. And it's, it's very real to all of us. And so that's to be asked, what keeps you up at night? That keeps me up at night, um, that and early flights. Uh, <laughs> But um, that's the answer. I mean, it, it, it's, it is more nuanced than that and there's more to it. Um, but the climate problem cascades to things like climate hazards, um, coastal resilience. You know, I can sort of walk through a, a set of, if you will, common buzzwords that we have all developed to, to develop a common language. But the big one is, there's a very real threat. Um, and I don't even know that we fully appreciate the threat, let alone how we contribute to um, 
moving the needle on, on that threat, whether that's through mitigation or adaptation. Um, that's it. Thank you. And thank you, Jim, for getting up in the middle of the night to be here with us today. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, the next question is from Peter. All right. Uh, first, thank you, Jim, for uh, being here and sharing your perspective with us. It's really useful. I, um, I've i noticed that several recent funding opportunities across the NSF have this bent towards allying basic research and applied research. Uh, the creation of the TIP directorate, the first new directorate in 30 years, uh, I think hints at this growing desire to seek out opportunities for allying basic and applied research. So I'm I'm generally curious to hear your thought on what this trend, if I can call it a trend, means for basic research uh, within the OCE and how uh, you all might see what we do, uh, how, um, how we might actually go about supporting basic research and then uh, how that relates to this movement towards uh, allying basic and applied research. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um... At the risk of, of wordsmithing, um, what I would say is rather than using the, the term uh, applied research, um, there's a, I prefer the term use inspired research. And the difference, there's a spectrum basic and applied where use inspired sort of sits in between. Um, and I'm, the name is failing me for the individual that, that sort of, came up with that a long time ago. Um, but if you think about, I'm just gonna continue using my example of marine carbon dioxide research. So there are basic research questions in underneath that umbrella that very much um, are use inspired. They, they would be to move the needle on atmospheric carbon dioxide um, by engaging the oceans. So that's where I think our community, if you will, it's not that we never do applied research. We do, our community can do applied research. It's, there's a spectrum. Um, and, and where we are most effective as a broader community is looking for that, that, that if you will, that basic research to use inspired re research, which is an, another way of thinking about that is very targeted basic research, um, if you will. And so is that sort of helpful to your question, Peter? Um, uh, I, I'll add unsolicited <laughs> um, the, the rise of TIP, um, as a new directorate and, and what I will say. And so at the time, the, um, at, at a time, the task list went out, uh, rise, which is a new division within the geo directorate, which also is, is attendant to some of the principles inside tip, um, was, has, has been stood up. So that was in April. I want to say April 24th of this year was, it was stood up as a division. And so this is a much longer answer to your question, Peter, but there's a recognition inside the foundation that there's, we're very much a basic research organization. Uh, what does use inspired look like? And then it moving all the way over to, to, if you will, TIP is how can the foundation and the TIP directorate get us to um, very much an end product in the innovation space, if you will. And so there's a, if you will, there is, an, and that very much bleeds into applied in applied work or, or an outcome, a specific outcome. And so NSF is a different organization today than it was 30 years ago <laughs> or so when, when I started. Um, so that's the answer is, is we are, we as an agency are very much thinking about the breadth, if you will, or the spectrum of things that we do, not divorcing ourselves from the sort of fundamental principle that we are an agency that works in this space, non-mission space. And 
we're not only happy there, we see ourselves as needing to be there for the scientific enterprise. Basic research discoveries lead quite often to different places that we need to go. Um, and it, so it's really expanding the portfolio, Peter, as the way I see it more than anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rick? Hey, Jim, thanks for joining us today. Um, can you guys hear me okay in there? Yes. Yep, great, thanks. Um, two questions about scientific ocean drilling, just because it's the first thing on our immediate horizon here. Um, there's a lot of conversation about cost, obviously, particularly in the O&M space. And I'm wondering about the capitalization aspect. And um, of course, I understand that NSF can only respond to input and uh, community enthusiasm or lack thereof. Um, but in that mindset, um, is there an appetite when seeking either alternative platform approaches or a new single platform approach? Is there an appetite for MREFs MREFC scale, um, pursuing MREFC scale investments in scientific ocean drilling. And a potentially allied question, um, sorry to hit two of you at once here, two questions at once, but a potentially allied question is, is do you envision any opportunities with TIP uh, potentially being engaged in the drilling conversation writ large. Thanks. <clears throat> so Rick, thank you for the question. Um, the easiest way, or one of the easiest ways to think about, you know, the 10 to 20 year problem um, is we need to build infrastructure that is as nimble as it can be, <laughs> and as cost effective to operate as it can be. Um, and I know that, that, that uh, <laughs> that's not very specific, um, but, but there's examples in the drilling community of building a very large vessel that is too expensive to operate. Um, and we need to avoid that end member, if you will. Um, so what I'm telling you is that no, um, MREFC is not, is not off the table. Um, we do need to figure out what, some, what a platform might look like and what it would cost to operate it. And so that, that's, that, is the, that is the pragmatic reality of where we are. Um, yeah, that makes, that makes sense. You don't wanna be making a, you know, a, big, a big old MREFC investment to build something you just can't operate either financially or structurally or what have you. But yeah. I got it. Yep, that makes sense. And then tip? I think there's opportunities there. I think as we progress towards defining better what it is we seek, those conversations could grow. Um, right now, I, right now, I don't exactly know what I would show up at the door of, of yep. our colleagues and tip with, um, but I'm a firm believer that everything's on the table until, until we have all the data otherwise that, that contradicts that. Yeah, no, got it. Thanks for those answers, Jim. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Josie. Yeah. Hi, Jim, and thanks for your comments this morning. They're really helpful. Um, and thank you in particular for your comment about climate. Uh, because I was a bit surprised not to see that more up front and center in the uh, statement of intent, because that is clearly what keeps me up at night, um, even though I'm not going to solve it myself. So my question actually builds into a, maybe a very simple question for you to answer, but it, uh, we were told to look carefully at the statement intent and ask you clarifying questions. And so I was curious about the term sustainable blue economy. 
been, and if that was narrowing our charge, I um, was thinking more about community impact and societal impacts. And so I was just wondering if you could discuss that a little bit. Yeah, th thanks for that. Uh, no, the, the comment about the blue economy is more example than it is a specific charge as this goes back to Peter's question um, and to really keep us thinking about how the ocean enterprise might interact in inspired use space or, or help us get to inspired use space, if you will. Um, there are our communities, the marine community has been active in the blue economy space. Um, is, there, is there a space for us there in a way that, that would offer leverage that we're not seeing just yet? And so, and I don't, honestly, I don't know the answer to that question, um, but, but that's, that's where it's coming from. So not narrow, but it's part of a portfolio of, of if you will, it, things to think about. Thank you. Uh, Jim Uter. Yeah, I had just another clarifying question about Tip is there is there now 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 rises on the table as well which is made me a little bit more confused than I was but is there is there an example now of OCE interacting with Tip or interacting with Rise that 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 would help help us understand how that partnership might work in the future? Um, I'll I'll talk in generalities, but okay. for example, um, we meaning OCE recently. So this is one of those, this is an example, but it's not Jim. Um, so OCE recently, um, recently partnered with multiple directorates across the foundation in, in uh, developing underwater technologies. And TIP wasn't part of that. So TIP, if, for those of you who don't know, it's only been around just a little over a year. So those conversations predate TIP, um, but of course I took the opportunity to show um, some of my colleagues in TIP. I said, you know, I, I think this is kind of space where we ought to be working together. And he said, absolutely. I wish you had, wish this had been brought to me uh, a year ago. Well, a year ago, it was three years into development. So, um, but, but I think what that does is, is develop an example where, um, TIP would be a natural partner in developing that. And so those conversations happen now and are ongoing, um, but they're all very much nascent is what I would say. Um, so as opportunities come up from, in, and I'll say from inside the broader geo directorate, um, rather than just, just OCE, um, that, 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 yeah. So there's definitely play, space for us uh, to work with TIP. And our colleagues in TIP are happy to listen too. And so and we could suggest some, I guess. And you could suggest some. Um, is that, did I get it all? I get it all? And yeah. Sure. For clarification, when you say you work with TIP, is that like you get a proposal that's technology related and then you fund some of it and they fund some of it? Or does the collaboration look different than that? I'll answer the question somewhat hypothetically, Allison. Uh, so it could go that way. But what I would say working with TIP really means is as we're building, as we take community input and as we're discussing ways in which we might accomplish a particular technology development for research underwater. Uh, um, if there's a space for, and all just sort of random pieces of example, um, who do we wanna reach out to that makes the most sense across the foundation to work with? Sometimes it can be, there would be, and this is now just sort of general this is the way it can work. There's other ways too, but sometimes you directorates can share funding on a proposal. Sometimes there can be a common solicitation where uh, our division might be funding one of the proposals or two of the proposals inside of a solicitation. 
Um, there's multiple ways you can go about that. And what I would say is, um, let us worry about those specifics because those are really conversations that we have across the foundation. We, there's a lot of really good people that have done really good work. And I'm always impressed at the different ways that the directorates uh, interact to support work. Um, so it, it varies a lot. Don't labor yourself with that. You, the, you've got a full plate. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, I'm letting folks that we haven't heard from yet skip the line. So, Shimi, you're next. Thank you, Jim, for answering our many, many questions. So, um, when I was preparing for this meeting, I, I was reading the the last DSOS meeting, and then also. Um, looking at the climate action plan and the UN, and I was struck by, you know, how far uh, those those recent plans, the climate action plan and the UN was, you know, reflects how far the nation has come in terms of diversity and the inclusion of multiple knowledge systems, especially Biden and Harris claiming, you know, using um, local knowledge systems to inform our decisions. And, um, and looking at the previous decade, you know, the DSOS meeting, I mean, while there's amazing, you know, priorities outlined there, there is hardly any mention of humans and local knowledge inclusion in that and co-production of knowledge. So I guess um, my question, you know, is what is NSF and OCEAN stance on, you know, and talking about these blurred lines between basic and applied science, you know, of, of how to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, and what is our charge in inclusion you know, of, of those local knowledge systems towards diversity. Yeah. There's multiple ways to answer that question. What is your charge uh, to the committee? Um, and so the simple answer, which is probably the least informative answer is as, so, Inside the foundation, what I will say is, and inside the federal family, um, we, and I will say the Ocean Climate Action Plan is a really good example of where um, reaching out to uh, local communities and gathering local knowledge was very much part of the, the, the backbone, if you will, of, of articulating the vision going forward. Um, I can say lots of those conversations have happened. There's folks inside the federal government that went and met with indigenous communities. History will really tell, tell us how good we are at it. Um, and what I will say is the first place we need to be to make a change is to recognize that we need to make a change. And I, and I think, we are very much there inside the scientific uh, enterprise. And so now I'm gonna to expand to keep thinking about a diverse community of stakeholders in the oceanographic community. We, we're a, a fairly narrow um, group of folks and what we want to do is broaden that and suggestions and wisdom from this committee and from the community that you will interact with will be taken quite seriously because we, it was, to be honest, I think about the first three or four things that were hot off the presses when I walked in last July 17th. Uh, that was one of the things that we were talking about quite a bit and, and how to be better at it. Um, I don't have the magic solution, um, but but it's something that is very much present in our thinking. Thank you, Shannon. I don't know if that was too vague to be. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks for being here. Um, so kind of to jump off of that a little bit, my question is about um, the second 
item on incorporating diversity uh, uh, principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, environmental justice. Um, I know that this is not anything new in general. Um, in fact, we think sometimes broader impact can be almost a cliche with NSF, right? So it's not new in the community, it's not new in NSF, but can you talk a little bit about some of the lessons learned in, in trying to implement this within other divisions at NSF and kind of from those lessons you've learned, what are some threads that you'd like to kind of see us continue to pull on or again, getting back to kind of the cliche point things that we could perhaps avoid or emphasize less? Yeah, um, I've been there just long enough to be dangerous with my answer. How's that? <laughs> um, the, th the threads to really pull on, um, this, probably, this might not be how you mean this, but one of the, th one of the more effective things we can do, um, I, I think, um, is as both as a division, as a directorate, and I. And when I think of us as a director, I think of ourselves as all of GEO and all of the problems we have in front of us are GEO problems. Um, what I think we can probably make strides or, or make inroads on is diversifying the institutions that come to uh, or that identify as playing a major role in the oceanographic research enterprise. Um, so I think that's over the shorter term, that's probably one of the things we we can do. And that that's that's some that's in our NSF's wheelhouse. How we do that is we will make efforts and we will seek wisdom, but that's what I would say is the the a first step is we interact a great deal with the scientific community who are largely not exclusively ac academic institutions. Those institutions sort of range from uh, basic research institutions where uh, faculty do very little teaching to much broader um, teaching portfolio institutions that have a, a smaller research portfolio. How do we engage with those communities? Um, how do we bring, ultimately, if we're to diversify the oceanographic enterprise, the students that are at those institutions are the students that we're trying to reach. And so it, that's high priority. That's, we need to figure out how to reach the, those institutions. Sadly, I think there's, there's examples of, of failures and there's examples of successes and we're trying to avoid the failures going forward. Um, part of it is recognizing, I'm going on with this, part of it is recognizing that portfolio of what institutions of higher education do. They don't just do one thing. And so it's, figure it's us figuring out us as a community figuring out how to engage more institutions where where people are thank you uh jason thank you jim for the presentation thanks for taking our grilling for the last hour and a half um, I have two questions. I'll ask them separate, so keep it straight. Building on this thread, um, when I hear used, inspired, you know, solution-oriented, multiple sectors, multiple disciplines, blue economy, my mind goes to coupled, not biogeochemical, not biophysical, but coupled social ecological systems. And I suspect the answer is probably similar to what you said to Jim about the polar program, but how much latitude do we have to table or, or come up with social or economic aspects of what we might suggest could happen, particularly in the impact space? And I'll, I'll come back with my other questions. Yeah, I, 
I'm going to answer your question by telling you what I'm not trying to do. <laughs> so what I'm not trying to do is micromanage what the community, what, what the committee is doing with the community. So um, with, with that said, um, you know, so the, the first order answer is this is a platform for community input. Um, so sort of have at it. The, but, but I also want to say that um, this sort of goes back to as, as we think about um, how OCE and the scientists inside of OCE interact with places they haven't traditionally in, interacted with. Some of that's really incumbent upon us to figure out how to do it. So the message received is reasonable um, and we'll figure out how to make it, to make it work. Um, does that make sense? It does, and I, I hear, I hear what you're not saying is well. <laughs> the the second question I have maybe is another way to get to Tuba's point earlier. We know what keeps you up at night. I, I want to know what's eating your lunch during the day. What top two or three things, and what can we do to perhaps help address some of those? Uh I don't think about it that way. I, so the, uh, when I think of sort of eating, eating our lunch, it's, um, there's a couple inexact answers to that question. You know, one of the, and, and I said this earlier, so I'm going to, I'm going to leverage all this off of this. One of them is, um, frankly, disperse too many dispersed priorities. Um, so we we need to be careful um you know quite frankly we do we need we need to think about the word priorities and what it really means and and how we can be most effective keeping in mind that our core research exploratory research mission has to be protected inside that that sort of umbrella of things that we do because there's opportunities there that we just don't know about um, so that's, yeah, that, that's sort of stumbling now, whether or not I've, I've brought myself to an answer to your question, but, um, it, the other part of eating the lunch. So that's part of it is making a laundry list. We'll eat, eat our lunch. Um, the other part is, and this is related to Rick Murray's question a little bit. Um, which is thinking about facilities. So I, yes, it, I think about our facilities uh, pretty much daily um, and, and the challenges we have in supporting an oceanographic research enterprise with its facilities. And I am, we're always, uh, we're always a bad day away from lunch getting eaten, if you will. Um, so, so that's, we have really wonderful people uh, inside the foundation that, that worry far more about that. Well, they worry more about it than I do. Um, anyway. I'm going to give a couple more new voices a, a chance. Um, Layla? Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for being here and, and also for giving us clarity um, earlier about the how we're developing this, this task list of these priority questions where NSF can have uh, impact. Um, I wanna kind of stay in the conversation that we're in now and just point out on the task list that, that the, the work to identify those solutions-based uh, projects for societal needs, uh, where it touches on equity, um, access and justice endeavors that is held aside from the task about developing those priority science topics. And I just wanted to get your perspective on, is this a call out um, to emphasize that as one of our priority topics, or is it a suggestion um, that um, this should be woven into each one of those priority topics because it is fundamental um, for us to create a fundamental shift in culture. 
it's woven. That's the shortest answer I will give for the rest of the day. <laughs> is that, is that Layla, does that get, get to your question? <laughs> Sometimes I do the. All right, thank you. Um, Marsha. Um, going back to the interagency question, how much do you think that this committee should engage with other agencies, whether through the NOP or through the SOST, for example, to help NSF define where they need to be with respect to that interagency collaboration? Um, my first reaction is not. Um, the, it, that's messy space, and you'll. I don't think, Marcia, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't think you will find it um, expedient or, or fruitful, if you will. It doesn't mean you can't talk to folks that operate under that umbrella, but that's really our, that's really our side to worry about how to make that happen. Um, and so it's a slightly short answer, but uh, the, I think that's the answer. All right, thank you. Brad Moran? You want to cut, you want to cut the lunch, that is fine. But I'll make a real quick question. You, you refer to the interagency and one is DOE. So where, you know, as, a, as this group, should we be thinking of DOE and uh, MCDR? And, and you know, there's just so much opportunity and they get out of that oceans game other than renewables. They should be back in it. I'm sure NSF would agree. But any comment on DOE uh, interagency efforts around ocean science that you might be able to speak to? Thanks, Jim. Uh, thanks, Brad. Before answering Brad's question, I have a hard stop at 12.30. Probably got other meetings I have to that head to. Um, Brad, the, I think I can say, let's put it this way. I have very high confidence that DOE was involved with the MCDR uh, solicitation. Um, so there's folks in DOE that are part of the meetings I've been in. Um, they're, they're very much, and you probably know this better than I, Brad, that DOE works in, in pretty different space than, than we do. Um, but I think there's opportunity, there's continued opportunity for interaction. Um, again, I would say you, you don't need to be sort of blind to interagency possibilities, but I really encourage folks to, as much as possible, stay out of trying to focus on those kinds of interactions. We'll, we can find the interactions that, that suit our needs because I can just assure you that those are rabbit holes of, of your time. And that's, uh, yeah. All right, speaking of time, <laughs> Tuba, do you wanna? Uh, I, I do wanna just kind of use the co-chair's prerogative and jump in um, with, with one last comment. And, and these last questions that we've been hearing about interacting with mission agencies, um, early on, Jim, we asked you a question and, and somebody used the word applied research and you kind of corrected it in a sense by talking about use inspired research and you've used that term a number of times. Um, I just want to make sure that we as a committee are very clear. NSF is a basic research entity, right? Uh, DOE, NOAA, all of those, ONR, those are mission agencies, right? And NSF is perhaps the only basic research engine. And so I am hearing you say, though, that maybe we should consider the balance between curiosity-driven research, basic research, and use-inspired basic research. But it's still basic research we are talking about. Is that clear? Is that so? I'm, I'm seeing you nod. Yes. 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 Excellent. Because I think that's important for this committee to think about. You know, we have a we want to go into those applied directions, but that's not necessarily NSF's arena. Yeah. Just, just one quick comment from the other coach here is, um, would it be fair to say that use inspired, the hypothesis are developed by the PI, whereas applied research, someone gives them the hypothesis and says, go do this. 
No. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I don't see it that way. And just because I've leaned on MCDR so much, I'm going to continue to lean on it. Um, I can think of a variety of of problems, if you will, um, inside of using the ocean's buffer capacity, if you will, that are basic research questions, but they're very much use inspired. How we how we scale that is we're we're trying in that particular example we're trying to go to a scalable problem so that's the use inspired or we're trying to we're asking basic research questions around a potential use okay jim this was highly informative uh we're so glad that you chose to come here and also come here in person to have this conversation with us i hope you will be open to us asking you more questions if as they arise as we're deliberating yes um but thank you really really appreciative it was my pleasure and um i would say thank me in about a year and a half <laughs> no, thank you. In all sincerity, thank you all for being willing to do this. Um, it's a big job. And we've got uh, a committee of folks that have a variety of experiences. And and I just want to say thank you again. And thanks for having me. And anytime you have questions, uh, I'm happy to come back um, to the committee. I only work, <laughs> work down the road a, a piece. Um, and so no problem. All right, and with that, I think we will close the webinar. I thank all the participants um, from uh, outside of the panel who